Mike Grattan, it's lovely to have you here for a former winner of the London Marathon. And I can honestly say it's not too often that I've sat next to a winner of the London Marathon. A, a little while ago now, we're looking back to uh, 1983. So um, what's that, if my maths are right? 29 years ago. Yeah, 30 years next year. What's it like to be at London today? Um, oh, I always love it. I've been actually part of this exhibition for the last um, 25 years. So I've been to the so I've really always feel at home. And the marathon itself doesn't attract me in the sense that I'll probably never do it again because I'm never going to run the times. And people, although I'm nearly 60 now, people kind of expect it to still be a good athlete. So uh, I probably would never run the marathon again, but just being around it, it's such a big buzz. And it, it is probably bigger than anything else you know, outside of soccer. It's the biggest single event uh, that happens in the country. Uh, so it's terrific just to be here all the time. Just take us back to that, that day in 1983 when, when you won. Were, were you expected to win that day? Um, I was among the favourites. I'd been third the year before. Uh, Hugh Jones won it in 2-9 and I trailed him third in 2-12, so quite a long way behind. But in between there, I went to the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane and ran got a bronze medal in 2-12 again. On a pretty tough course on a hot day. Um, and um, Dick Costello won that in 2-9 in, uh, and went on to run 2-7 in Boston soon after. So I knew kind of that, that the London course would be quicker than the Commonwealth Games course. So I set the target 210, actually ran under that. Um, 209, 47, 3, 43. Yeah. So, was, so, so everything just fell right in the day. The pace was right. I was running exactly the right schedule. Um, Emil Putterman from Belgium, who had been the world 5K champion, ran two, started too fast and took a big group of athletes with him. And they all ran at world record speed for the first half and then started to fade. So by keeping my pace back and just following them from a the distance, um, picking them up in the second half of the race, it all worked out perfectly. At what point um, were you, did you go into the lead? Um, 22 miles, just in front of the Tower of London. Uh, at about 18, we, there's a guy called Jerry Helm from St Helens who finished second that year. Not many people remember Jerry, but he ran 2.10 to finish second. And um, we, we kind of, from halfway, we started to catch up with the leaders. We caught them at 16 miles. And at 18 miles, the two of us broke away in the lead. Uh, and we had a couple of little surges to test each other. And I just felt that my surges were a bit more effective than his. And we got onto the cobbles. In those days, we ran on the cobbles in front of the tower and not, not on the road behind. And it was slippy, and he dropped back a yard. And I thought, ah, oh, this is my chance. So I really pushed on and pushed on and broke away. So all the way down the embankment, uh, and then up the mail, because we used to go up the mail and finish on Westminster Bridge in those days, uh, I, I was just gradually pulling away all the time. Uh, and running terrified, because I thought, uh, I'm not that far away from it. If I, if I fold, if I've gone too early, he's going to catch me again. But gradually, going down Birdcage Walk with half a mile to go, I realised this is it, I'm going to win it. And uh, yeah, just great feeling. God, what an amazing moment. I mean, there are, just, there are so many brilliant runners out there that will never experience that. And the emotion and everything, when you put a race together like that, just must be something that never leaves you, even you know, nearly 30 years later. Well, well uh, it's a defining moment in your life. Mm. Um, I know we spoke off camera just a minute ago about Port of Active's 215. Even if she doesn't win the Olympics, it's just such an amazing thing Absolutely. to do. So for me, I didn't go to the Olympics. I got injured in 84 and didn't get to Los Angeles. But that London win kind of is the pinnacle of my career. And for most people, uh, who, because we live in Britain, most people consider the London Marathon to be more important, almost. So yeah. if you say you're a London winner, they say, oh, that's fantastic. If I say I've got one medal for the Commonwealth Games, it doesn't raise too much of a smile. So uh, it, it kind of for a British person winning London, uh, it's such a big deal. Um, so yeah, I've lived on it for 29 years. So hope you keep living more. on it. Yeah. Keep living on <laughs> it. Um, the, the times are obviously coming down, and they're, you know London's been won in, in quicker quicker times yeah, now. But yeah. but you mentioned earlier you threw out a stat that your time actually in the last how many years would have still finished you in the well, top I think ten or unless something. I, unless I haven't got it right in the last couple of years, I've been in the top eight of every London Marathon there's ever been from day one. Wow. So, so although the winning times are improving, the depth quite possibly isn't the same as yeah. it used to be. Um, I, I, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but there were about 85 to 90 sub 220s amongst British runners in London in 83. Wow. Uh, and you don't get that number of sub 220s out of all the internationals, let alone just British runners now. So, so the, the, the front end is even sharper, but there is less, less and less depth in the race than there used to be. Um, I'm not sure why that is, actually, because they're inviting enough athletes, so why they all tail off uh, and finish slowly, I don't know. But um, certainly from a British point of view, it would be great to see. A, a Mo Farrell or someone to come through and, and get 
if you get 20 or 30 sub 220s out of that you're set to get the next mm. next champion come along so you know, ever hopeful that that will happen that's an interesting point about mo because he's sort of showing his talent now over sort of all distances well right up yeah. to, to to half marathon yeah but what do you think i mean it's i think that crossover from a half marathon to a marathon you don't know until you've done it do you just because you're yes. a great half marathon runner doesn't make it, you a it great marathon runner um, i mean the the, the, the Asses and Turgats are in the minority. Mm, yeah. Mostly people who become good marathon runners uh, these days uh, have got good 10k speed but they're not the very best 10k runners, they're more mm. endurance based. So what often happens is someone um, is world class at 5 and 10k but they're kind of muscle tight leads them to be fast mm. and they move up to the marathon and after about kind of 30k yeah. They, they haven't got the ability to store the energy and they start to fade mm. away. You see that all the time. Mm. You expect someone to run a great marathon. I just think that, that Mo is showing all the credentials of someone who could move up. Yeah. Uh, he's not positionally quick over a mile, say. Mm. Um, so he's not really a speed-based athlete. He's running his fast 10Ks off very much strength, which may lend him towards being a really good marathon runner. It would be great so, to see. Great, yeah. I can watch yeah. him all day long run. So to watch him over yeah, 26 yeah. miles uh, would be... a running style. Yeah, absolutely. How, how do you think um, the times have changed marathon? and training, preparation. You at the time when you won London were, were a teacher, you were yeah. basically working full time. Sure. That's quite different these days with the elite runners. It, it, it is, yeah. I mean, I was running 120 mile weeks regularly. I went up to 140, which is getting wow. exhausted, so I dropped back down again. Um, now, Big mileage then. It is big mileage, but you can run 140, 160 miles a week if you're not working. Um, so you can absorb more. Uh, and the whole kind of medical infrastructure, diets, um, all those things are much more refined. And we knew all about it, but we didn't have access to it very much. Uh, and in 84, when I hoped to go to the Olympics, I got injured. And um, I was being covered by Booker in those days, but I dropped out of the top, whatever, 50 in the world. Um, so they dropped me off the scheme, and just at the time that I needed it. <laughs> so it was a nonsense. That wouldn't happen now, I don't think. I think if an athlete was showing that kind of class, they, they would be, be looked after in a better way. Mm. And there would be more money. I won $10,000 for winning London. You can't set up. What's the, the prize money? Run. What's the prize money on Sunday? Well, well, the prize money itself isn't that huge. It's probably in the hundreds of thousands. But, but, but there's more support in terms of shoe companies like a Nike or an yeah. Adidas. We'll pay a big bonus. Yeah. There, there are time time bonuses. If you set a world record, yeah. then you get more. You could come out of London you know, a millionaire, a dollar millionaire at least. But then you can afford to have someone look after your diet and regularly have massages, those things. Just not, not yeah. um, attainable in, in the early 80s. So you kind of live in your era, and I think it limits you, your, your aspirations slightly. So I think if we were around now, I, I think I could possibly have run a 27 or 28, not the world record speed. Um, but uh, certainly a Steve Jones. Um, we was, talked about Steve Jones yeah. earlier, and you mentioned the story about Chicago when he went through yeah. half halfway in 101 or something 101, ridiculous. Uh, uh, not wearing a watch. Not wearing a watch. Then he slowed down to still run 27. But I think if he was around now, he would certainly challenge the top um, Kenyan yeah. and Ethiopian runners. Yeah. And certainly wouldn't let them have an easy time of it. Uh, and he was capable of running a 24 or 25 way back in the early 80s. Um, yeah. For the sake of a digital watch, I think he would have done it. <laughs> uh, but if he was racing now, I think uh, he would have been one of the British athletes who, who would still be there living with, with the top athletes. But, you know, Charlie Spedding, myself, Hugh Jones, we probably got down to 2.7 or 2.8. Uh, because you, you live in your generation, and if 2.9 is good enough to win it, that's what you do. Uh, and if, if it was required 2.5 or 2.6 to win it, then that's what you do. Um, but there is a point where the, the greater leg speed of some of these Kenyan athletes now over 10K doesn't, doesn't help someone who's really a marathon based runner like myself. Someone like Richard Maroka, uh, Eamon Martin, who were running very fast 10Ks, would probably still look at the pace a bit better. Yeah, so yeah. I had a different style of training. I had to train for endurance because I didn't have great 10K speed. And it worked in those days, right. but you've got to be a great 10K runner now. Yeah. Well, you after that that great race in '83, you retired from uh, being a teacher, yeah. and you set up your company, uh, to, which I don't know if it was named that back then, but it's the 209 Events. Yeah, no, it was called well, it was called Mike Batten Tours in those days, and then Leisure Pursuits. We came to 209 Events in the uh, turn of the century, and um, before 118 came along, actually, so I was using numbers before they did. Um, it's a long story, which I won't go into, but but. but um, it, it just seemed to me that no British runners were running a sub 210. Uh, and it's a good target to have. So the 209 thing, let's go out and run 209. I kind of wanted to get that over. Then it's a quality time still that's aimed at that. Uh, and it became the name of the company after, uh, after a while. Um, unfortunately, it, it didn't kind of work. And no one came along and said, yeah, if Pratton could run 209 all those, those years ago, 
than we can. And there are better athletes than me out there. I, mean, I think um, Lemoncello, for instance, I think is a class runner and is quicker over 10k than me. Um, with the application and a bit of luck, he's somebody who can come down to two nines. There are people out there, I think, who can do it. Um, they're going to want to do it, and they've got to believe they can do it, and that's kind of what's missing. I believe I could do it, um, partly because Hugh Jones did it, and I would race Hugh Jones every weekend. My training partner at the time was Nick Vaughan, who ran 2 in in New York out of the blue in 1981. So I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. We need British athletes to believe that mm. if they can do it, we Absolutely. can do it. Absolutely, it's so. a belief thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's kind of getting out there and doing the work and believing yeah. in yourself and well, having the discipline There, and there are people doing the work. There are runners out there running 120, 140 miles a week, and somehow it's not quite working for them in the races. Whether that's because the front end of the race has now moved away so far, so you're running in limbo, I don't know. Because yeah. I was at two line pace, I was near the front of a race. At two line pace now, I'm five minutes off the pace. So maybe that's changed. And if you're British one is now running around 2.10 and chasing, chasing all the time. Um, so they, they sometimes maybe just trying a bit too hard. It, it'll come, it'll happen. And so how, how's 2.09 doing at the moment? Um, we're in travel and that's a tough market to beat. Yeah, yeah. We're still taking 500 people to New York. Uh, we started with training camps in the Algarve way back in 1984, that's how the whole thing started. We had 100 people down there this year in, in March, mostly uh, people training for London. Uh, most not beginners, but people who, not good runners, but just want to improve, yeah. maybe from four and a half hours to four mm. hours, or four hours to three and a half hours. So it's kind of working with those kind of people. Um, people like Nick Anderson, who's one of our best coaches now, came down. Um, Bruce Tuller, who was around in the 60s, European 5,000 meters champion. He still comes down in the training council with us. So we've got a great kind of coaching network. Um, and we organize races. Next year, we're looking at um, a race at the Mercedes World in, uh, in Waybridge. Well, in Brooklands, in Waybridge, yeah, in Waybridge where the yeah. museum is. Yeah, we'll start and finish on the Brooklyn circuit, and we hope to have 5,000 runners down there. Wow. It's a free London race. So there's lots of stuff happening. Is that going to be a half marathon? or a, a half marathon, okay. yeah, it's kind of free London build up. Wow, okay. It's taken us three years to get off the ground. It's, it's hard to close roads and things. So yeah. Finally got there with Surrey, Surrey Highways. So that, that will happen. So, yeah, 2 and 9, the kind of still based in travel but um, uh, and we do organize our own events abroad we have um, a wine marathon in Bhutan next May marathon in June wow in, in fascinating February all, all mostly specialist trail running but yeah but uh, just but I, I, I choose my events based on where I want to go yeah I was gonna uh, say Bhutan's like a bit out uh, there I mean it is yeah yeah, yeah. But there are a friend of mine, Richard Donovan from Ireland, that organises the Ice Mountain in the South Pole, and he's just come back from the North Pole. There's so many things you can do in money, yeah. which are not just the London Mountain or yeah. New York. Yeah. And these are the volume things, but my interest really is the specialist and the fun things to do. And uh, people still want to go to them. Yeah, and, uh, fantastic. Yeah, London and New York will always be there, but um, yeah, the idea, once you've done London New York, what do you do next? Let's go yeah. to Bhutan, let's go to the South yeah. Pole. And, uh, they have the fabulous trips. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, um, just on a last note, Mike, ahead of this weekend's race, what, what are your predictions? I really don't have any. Um, I haven't even seen the start list, if I'm honest. Uh, but <laughs> so it'll, it'll be 1 in 2.5 and about 2.21. 2.5 and 2.21? Yeah. Depends on the weather. If it's really wet and, and windy, maybe a little bit slower. But if, if the rain stops and it's not too windy as it is now, the men's race is still going to be one. Always going to be around two five, two six. Okay, so you heard it here. Mike Grattan said it. It's going to be one in two o five and two twenty one for the women. Yep. Lovely to talk to you, Mike. Yep. Really good, and I uh, hope you have a great day on Sunday. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yep. We're watching out on the course this year. Brilliant. Yes. Bye. Okay, thank you.